I hope this uh, fantastic topic will uh, bring more people in the room. But nevertheless, uh, I'll try to share you uh, our vision on uh, the rise of autonomy. Um, maybe some of you may uh, remember that um, four years ago, just before the COVID, there was an uh, astounding announcement uh, on autonomous flying. Most of them were pushed by um, some GAFA companies explaining to the, to the world that AI will be the next technology to, uh, to, to perform these flights. Pushing a little bit out of the stage, the traditional uh, aeronautic uh, technologies and industry. And um, where are we today? This did not happen, obviously, but uh, I want to share with you today that um, autonomy is still very close and autonomy is still a no-brainer for uh, our industry. So, why should we go to autonomy? You, you, know, you all know the reason. Of course, uh, we are looking in a most, more and more automatized world uh, for more safety. We all know that there is a, um, a contradiction in our paradigm today because in a very automatized aircraft, we ask the pilot to be the last resort in the machine, rather than the machine to be the last resort. But he has absolutely less and less occasion to be, uh, uh, to, to, to be the one mastering the system. On the other hand, uh, there are costs. Uh, and uh, the, the UAM, uh, from the, the early 20s, we are just saying we need to have more and more automatized systems and at least autonomous. In fact, both, both are necessary and um, both are possible, but there is a breach or um, a threshold that we have to cross. And this threshold is um, pi the pilot is not anymore the last resort in the machine. Machine is the last resort. So. How can we handle that? And there are some very clear dimensions of the problem. Uh, I propose you three dimensions. One of the dimensions is, of course, automation versus adaptation. And this is more a technologic uh, axis. But this one is very important. And some of our great world players today say more smart automation than autonomy. But autonomy. And the definition I, I propose you is the breach when machine is the last resort. Then um, you have the, this other axis about the environment. It's not the same thing to fly in the control airspace and to fly in, in the free airspace with uh, um, many traffic that you, you, you don't master, you don't even monitor. It's not the same in civil airspace and uh, uh, in a conflicted uh, military space. Uh, and today, I uh, should have said that at the very beginning, we are speaking of flying in civil airspace. That means navigating, communicating, taking off, landing, and so on. And the third dimension for the civil airspace, of course, and even for military airspace now, is flying autonomously as a single vehicle or um, designing the autonomy in a system of systems. And of course, if you think of flying in the civil airspace today, civil airspace is already a system of system, and you have to integrate the autonomy in the system of system. Then, considering that, we have something to, to do with technologies. Of course, we need new technological assets to solve the problem. We need to bring smart adaptive systems on board. We need to detect, we need to understand, we need to react, we need to change the plan. And this is not always possible if you take all the three dimensions I propose to you uh, with our classical technology. So you need to integrate these technologies. And intrinsically, these technologies, they do not comply with the classical scheme we use for ensuring sa safety. Uh, and that's one point. On the other hand, do you know or did you even expect why people are quite reluctant to go into an aircraft for, for traveling with no pilot? 
they, they very easily go into a, a subway with no driver. No problem. Even some of them, they are going on the front car just to see the tunnel. But if you know the system for controlling the subway, you will, you will not be so confident. <laughs> Nothing about the subway. But we are engineers. We know. Um, some of them, they like to go in an uh, autonomous taxi. But you see, for instance, in California, there are some users today that are not so keen now to go to the autonomous taxi because they, they experience some difficulties. But very rare are people who want to go into an aircraft without the pilot. And my proposal to solve that question is just, they like to think that the pilot is risking his life or they are risking their own life by flying. And flying is not natural to human being. So we, we need to keep we need to keep the standard historical framework to ensure safety. And even to the authorities, even to the population that are underneath the fly, you need to propose the classical, well-known framework for safety. And the, the key here, I propose you, is to combine deterministic technologies with smart adaptation systems that we can envisage today. Then, Considering that, um, there is an interesting case to look at the UAVs for growing autonomy. When you, you want to, uh, to perform operations through a, new, a, a UAV, you have no choice. You, you need to have your machine as a last resort, uh, ensuring safety. That's obvious. And now, uh, and this is really uh, an opportunity today, uh, we have in Europe a very clear regulation for that up to some level of operations uh, through the, the ESA framework from cell 4, cell 6 operations who are determining the level of exposure to risk that uh, you are allowed to, to do. But at the same time, if you want to be efficient from an economical point of view, if you want to find some customers for drone system, you have to be efficient on the mission. And here I put uh, just um, an illustration about, for instance, surveying um, long, uh, long on long distances, uh, pipes or electric lines, or everything you want. It's quite classical engineering stuff to have a drone flying over this infrastructure and ensuring the full level of safety which, which is required for say four, say six operations. I'm not saying it is easy, but it is classical engineering stuff. But if you just do that, there is um, a, a, a real, um, let's say, probability that your drone will not be efficient. Each time the condition of the missions change, he will come back home, and the cost of the surveillance for the kilometer, for the line, for the electric line, or for the pipes, will raise. And in that environment, it's not allowed. So if you want to have both safety ensured on a formal point of view and mission efficiency, you need once again to combine smart adapt adaptive systems with the, um, uh, the certification or safety framework that we are uh, used to, uh, to deploy uh, in aeronautics. Just a small uh, video to show you how we uh, ha handle that today um, um, in Thales. Uh, and the interesting part of that is that the system I will show you is, do, is today applicant uh, to the ESA for cell four and then cell six uh, operations. So it has a formal uh, framework to certify its, uh, uh, its safety level. And at the same time, it's quite easy to, um, uh, to integrate in that system uh, additional um, uh, subsystems, I would say, today, today uh, with adaptive capabilities, which are not deterministic. So this is the way uh, we, we want to demonstrate that combination. So it's a fully automatic drone system, as I told you, uh, reaching to the uh, sale 4 capability. It's flying in Canada uh, today. 
Um, and, and during these flights, we ensure this uh, safety framework. And then uh, we gave to the, um, uh, to, to the AI on board uh, a mission, and the mission is to follow a car. And for, of course, by following the car, there will be contradiction between the, the initial corridor for the navigation we provide to, to the drone. And uh, it has to comply both with its capability to go back safe home and following that car. And also complying with, for instance, with obstacles and so on. And by doing that, the interesting approach is that we are assessing now this concept for combining the formal safety framework that uh, we are committed to, uh, uh, to follow for the, uh, the safety of the drone operation. Sorry, I don't know about that. Um, okay. The, the, the formal framework, and then on the, on the other hand, to add uh, smart adaptive controllers. For the time being, those smart adaptive controllers, they are quite limited. It's ob obstacle detection and avoidance, for instance. You have seen it with the electric lines, and part of the um, navigation system, autom um, autonomous capability to navigate and to choose the adaptation of the mission in a certain area rather than in a corridor. But step by step, now we are combining these smart adaptators to go further and further on the uh, performance of the mission and still having those controllers, I would say, monitored and controlled by a formal safe controller, which is certified. That's the strategy that we deploy for that. And considering that, and having a lot of discussions with people in, engaged in autonomous flying, I think now the path is more and more clear to go to safe autonomous flying. Then uh, as a conclusion, I would say that there are three pillars on this vision. The first one, we were speaking a lot about autonomy uh, in 2019 and after COVID, even if we see that, for instance, it will be difficult for the first flights or EVTOL on UEM to, uh, to, to be autonomous. There is still a need for autonomy for both efficiency, cost, and safety. Second, the key for the success is not opposing the type of technologies, but rather than finding the, the right concept, the right framework for the classical safe design in aeronautics to integrate those smart adaptators, and in order to do so, we have to do it in a system of system, which is a complex part of developing that. And third, it's starting now. I say today, it is possible to integrate AI in a formally safe system that is going to certification. That's it. I'd be very happy to answer your questions, even questions coming from people who are not at the introduction. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation, and there is enough time left for some questions. According to your insights, when will we see the pilot-less planes? Huh. Um, I think that the, uh, the, the, the air framers are not really speaking of pilot-less. Uh, and first of all, as I said, um, uh, autonomy, for instance, for air transport is not just a technical point, it's also a social point. Uh, are you sure you want to go into that plane without any pilot risking his life with yours? Even if planes today are very safe. Not sure. Uh, I would say the UAVs have no pilot, and the UAVs are going to astonish the world because they, they are safe, they are green, uh, they are uh, cheap, and they may ve be very efficient on new missions. So we will get as accustomed on the UAVs doing more and more things, I think, that's my belief, before we go to really the pilotless. But just, uh, and j j just have a, a, a small reminder. When Garmin uh, proposed to the uh, general aviation its uh, safe back home as an autonomous capability, it was wow. Mm -hmm. It was wow. Thank you. 
Uh, is legal responsibility an issue regarding flying autonomously? Is? Legal responsibility. Oh, yes. uh, in fact, that's the, the benefit of uh, the new regulation. Uh, of course, you always have your legal responsibility when you operate. But you have now a framework and you, you provide to the world the same type of warranty for safety that you provided for uh, manned aircraft. And there is a legal responsibility when you fly with the pilot over populations, mm -hmm. and you have exactly the same thing when you fly a non-man or not, not man piloted aircraft. But the regulation provides you the right frame to know what is your exposure. And you see, this is not the case in automotive. And this is part of the problem in the automotive where there is still something to solve. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Next question, can training data from UAVs be used to train AI models for airplanes? <laughs> That's an interesting idea. Um, <laughs> I, I am not absolutely sure, just for one reason. Uh, the UAVs, the limit of the parallel between the UAVs and the planes is that you use the UAVs uh, in conditions where you won't use the planes. I showed you the three dimensions uh, where we think autonomy and um, uh, UAVs and planes are not exactly occupying the same. Um, you fly a, an air transport aircraft in a very well-known environment, which is quite predictive. You don't fly the UAVs at the same, in the same place. You fly them in the G space where everything can happen. Okay, next question. Where is the difference in terms of consumer perceived risk between riding an autonomous train in London which is reality and used by many people every day, and flying without a pilot. <laughs> I don't know where the, where the difference is, but I would say it's not natural for people to fly. It's natural to, to, to move on the ground, and maybe some kinds of a guts feeling that we can rely on an autonom uh, autonomous train, and maybe we are afraid to, go, um, to, to fly on an autonomous aircraft. But just one additional thing. There is... Uh, Something which is uh, announced in the aircraft very often when you fly to, uh, 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 to airport with a lot of fog. Sometimes the lady tells, tells you, uh, uh, thanks to uh, the high level of qualification of the crew, we are going to be able to land today in a full automatic way. If you think of this sentence, it's a nonsense because it is automatic, so we don't need the pilot. And people uh, feel safe. So you see, uh, we are not just uh, uh, saying things which are on the, on the rational side, but on uh, the non-rational side, in order to have customers confident. Mm -hmm. And the last question, what is the biggest hurdle for autonomous flight? Oh, uh, I, I think there are two of them. Uh, the, the first one, everybody knows, is detect and avoid, because it's very difficult to prove detect and avoid if you are not in a controlled airspace. But the second one may be communicating, because e of course we have the UTM, but nobody knows today how the UTM and the ATM will, um, will mix, and we will have UAVs communicating. And I will say you something, we are, we are today uh, working with the a, with a French police. Uh, and in their requirements, sometimes they want to enter some D airspace. Class D airspace, you need to have um, um, vocal clearance. Mm -hmm. So we put a radio on the UAV to be able to have the, the vocal clearance. But tomorrow, if you, you, you break the link, you need the, the UAV to be able to to, to listen to the, uh, to the controller and to answer the controller, because you are not in a UTM. Mm -hmm. it, is, it, it, it will be able to do so, but will it answer uh, the right way? Mm -hmm. Will it really hyphen, understand mm -hmm. what the controller wants? I don't know. Mr. De Valdestin, thank you very much for your presentation, and thank, thank you very you. much for answering the questions. Thank you.